Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered why it is you can't focus on the things that you're hoping to focus on and pay attention to the things that really matter? That's what we'll talk about today. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. We only have today. Let us begin. Mother Teresa. Last episode, we talked about a book by Oliver Bergman called 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. And he has a real problem with the way that we think about time, that we think about how we should prioritize or do productivity tricks in order to use more time more effectively. And we talked about in the past podcast about how it's destroying our relationship with time, our inability and stress related to the fact we can't get everything done, and then how it affects our attention because we feel like we can't get everything done. We start distracting ourselves so we can get away from the pain of what he calls a productivity trap. In the last part of his book, he talks about how we can start taking control of these things, how we can start actually trying to get rid of this way that we're thinking about time and start actually moving towards something else. It feels that a lot of times when we're looking at the tasks we have to do, we're just trying to do the next thing to survive on the next task. We wash our clothes to get clean clothes. We feed ourselves so that we have the next meal in place. But instead, we're not taking a look at our relationship with time and we're not talking about our future and what is going to really matter to us to get us to the future we want to have and how we just feel bad all the time and stressed all the time because we never quite get to our future because we never feel like we have enough time to get there. He doesn't quite feel like all of this is our fault. He feels like the entire system of grades in school, of tasks that teachers put in front of us, the chores our parents gave us, and then gave us money to accomplish those chores, was just our education into this time trap. And that we learn this from a young age, and we decide to take this time in this way that's just mangling our whole being and really gave it all the control. We have these time tools that keep us on track. And instead of actually making us have meaning in life and having value in life, we're just in this trap of constantly trying to do more. And he says that it's even worse because we get all these ideas of time well spent, of wasting time from society itself, instead of coming up with our own definitions and even throwing things like idleness and rest into those buckets of wastes of time because we're not focusing on doing the things we need to do. And he says that for us to get true rest, we have to stop focusing on the future and just start enjoying time off right now. Just live in that present moment. And when we do that, we'll be able to sleep. We'll be able to rest and actually get back some of our energy that we've been burning away. He wants us to think about the difference between when we have a holiday versus when we have time off. Because a holiday is when everyone in your community has off. And how much more relaxing that is. Because work isn't piling up. Because everybody's off. Your family's enjoying each other. You have time to spend with each other. And it's not just you taking a day here or there. But it's you actually spending quality time relaxing with the people who matter the most, knowing that work is almost on hold for everybody in your society. And that is actually better for us. And then the other part of it is that we really need to have the people around us that matter too. We need other people. We need to have a community. And we need to be able to do things with our communities. I was just talking to someone at work and they were talking about how companies now are taking communal holidays, which just sounds wild to me. And it's that same concept of that holidays are better than vacations because everybody's gone. Communal time together with your coworkers makes your work 
more valuable and better. And people are finding that they get to know each other better and they get to learn to like their colleagues a lot better. One study they talked about in 2013 in Sweden from a person named Terry Hartig, and they found that when Swedes take time off from work, they're happier when everybody in the country is off from work. And his idea is that knowing everyone is on vacation makes everyone happier. But I think, too, that it's also because it allows us to hang around with the people we care about because around holidays, other people are off as well. And so that quality of life is there. And that reminds me of people who take digital Sabbaths where they just decide, I'm not going to look at my phone. I don't know that I could even go a month, much less a day, without having some sort of way of knowing what the news is, what's going on in the world. And that's a real problem that he says is hurting me because it's always me thinking about the past, what just happened, or the future. Boy, I hope I have enough to retire instead of just living right now. And then he talks, too, about when we take these holidays from doing things, we also can do things on a smaller basis, which would be doing things that don't matter at all. They don't have a purpose. They don't have a reason to do them. They don't have an end goal. And he calls these hobbies because they don't pay off. They don't really do anything. You might read a book that is completely unrelated to anything that you're doing. You might take a walk in the woods, but everything that you do with these hobbies is for the just the pure point of doing them and not to try to get to some bigger goal. And sometimes we get embarrassed about it when we spend time doing something that is completely worthless because it feels like to other people, maybe we wasted our time. He says that's a problem, that we should be able to get real rest, which means actually resting, getting away from things, having that digital Sabbath, and doing something frivolous, doing something that just doesn't go anywhere. My friend and I started doing watercolor painting through YouTube. So we bring up a YouTube video and we get our paints out and we try to paint what someone is showing us how to paint. And to be honest, we're not great at it, But we enjoy it a great deal. And it's funny how it does give you this rest because I'm never going to be a painter. I'm probably never going to be really good at it. But just trying this and just sitting down with those paints is really relaxing. So he gives some advice about what to do now that we've realized that time has been a problem for us. First of all, because we're not focused on the projects or the people who are most important to us, but also because we are thinking that we can do everything and get everywhere. So once we come to the realization that we need to be around the things and the people that matter the most, we need to limit the things that we need to get done, what do we do now? So he asked some questions of us to help us figure out what we should do. He talks about this professor at Harvard, Jennifer Roberts, who teaches art history And her very first assignment is to pick some form of art and go stare at it for three hours. And it's uncomfortable for people. They are told that they're not allowed to look at their phones. They're not allowed to go run out and get a snack. They're told they're not allowed to go wander around and look at other art. They're supposed to sit there for three hours and look at a single piece of art. And she says that it slows them down makes them focus, and that they even go through stages. At first, they're laughing about it, and then later, they're irritated, thinking of ways that they can break the rule by going and focusing on something else. But then, when they get later into the process, they finally just give up, and they start actually focusing on that piece of art. So you have to get past that time of anger, discomfort, wanting to crawl out of your own skin and just give into the process until the discomfort goes away. And I think that's a good analogy to when we actually try to get true rest, whether it's taking a nap or painting something or trying to get away from our stress. 
it will feel uncomfortable at first because we're not accomplishing if you're anything like the author or even a little bit like me, where you feel like you must accomplish it. You really must learn to get that true rest because otherwise you will just get burned up in this process. Then the second step he says we have to do is stop going for these unobtainable things that we think we need to do, either because things are too hard in the amount of time we've given ourselves, or perhaps we demand too much perfection out of them. So to fix that, he says that what we have to do is, quote, embrace radical incrementalism, making that we're going to break things down into smaller steps, that we're going to accomplish things slowly over time, and we're going to not demand perfection from ourselves. We're going to learn new skills. We're going to accumulate experience. And that early phase of whatever project we're going to do is going to be a lot of experimentation, trying something, having it fail. But because we're giving ourselves the amount of time it takes to do this, and maybe even a little bit more, and we're getting away from the perfectionism, we're actually going to do better. We have to realize that we're going to have to take it in smaller steps at the beginning. And once we get our feet under us, then we'll be able to actually start making bigger progress around them. We have to quit shuffling our tasks around, multitasking all the time, and instead focusing on the most important thing and giving it whatever time it takes to get done. And by doing that valuable thing, we will be better for it. We'll actually accomplish something that matters. He wonders that where in our life are we looking for comfort or stress release? Are we throwing ourselves into books? Are we trying to play video games? Are we procrastinating by doing things in our house that don't really matter just because we don't feel like doing something that's important? And are we doing that so that we can procrastinate or get away from the things that are causing us stress? And are those things, when we get away and we do something stressful, is it causing problems in your life where it's actually increasing your anxiety because now you have even less time to get things done? Or are you doing it because it's actually restful and causing you to get away from stress? He wonders if you're holding yourself to some kind of a standard that you couldn't possibly meet. He wonders what ways we are not accepting who we really are or who we think we should be. Can you be the best you possible? Blaming yourself because you're not good at X, Y, and Z when you could get there if you would take time to learn those things but you don't take time. Instead, you just blame yourself. And this pressure he feels that when we think about these things that we believe we should be, particularly when we're young, he talks about a therapist named Stephen Cope, who says, quote, it finally dawns on us, shockingly, that no one cares what we're doing with our lives. This most unsettling discovery for those of us who have lived someone else's life and eschewed our own that no one really cares except us. And you realize that, you know, that in the end, people are busy in their own things. They're worried about their own lives. And so you think, oh, well, what if I go to work in this wrinkled shirt? What will people think? I bet you half the people won't notice. A lot of times we put pressure on ourselves and we hold ourselves up to all these types of standards that we think other people are holding us up to. And in reality, they don't even notice. We think people are paying attention to us and criticizing us, but in reality, they're not even thinking about us. And in a way, it's a little depressing, but in reality, it's freeing because all those rules we hold ourselves to, no one's even looking at us. No one's even noticing and that we should stop living the lives that we think other people want us to live. He asks if there's still areas of your life you're holding back and you know you should be doing it. Maybe you have a great idea for a business, but you never quite get around to it. Maybe you know there's this one thing that would improve your life more than anything, and you never do it. What's the one thing you're not doing that's holding you 
in a place you don't want to be? How would you spend your days if you didn't care so much about seeing your actions have results? So if you weren't so focused on productivity and so focused on effort, what would you be doing instead? And isn't that an interesting question? And thinking about the podcast, I thought about that too. There used to be this person on a talk show and she always talked about walking around with a fake magic wand. Because if you could just wave a magic wand and solve this problem, what would that change be? What would magically fix this problem for you? And in a sense, it's like if you could magically wave your wand and do exactly what it is you wanted to do, what would you do? And that if you're not following your path of what you could do, that is the next right thing, the next important thing, then you're probably not getting to the places that you wanted to go. If you're always doing the things you have to do, you must do, you feel society expects you to do, you're limiting your own ability to get fulfillment, of finding your purpose in life, and actually working towards your purpose in life. And that eventually we just give up hope. And when we have no more hope, that's really where things just go poorly for us. And when we actually get to the places where we're doing the things we want to do or doing the things that our life's purpose was meant to do. I'm not someone who believes in following your dreams because I think you have to have skill and purpose involved. I am thoroughly in favor of living a purposed life. And so once we get to that place, we're actually living out what our purpose is meant to be. We actually stop thinking about what we have to do next, looking at task lists, because we actually know what we're supposed to do next, because it's just built into our soul about what we're supposed to be doing. According to him, I think I always need some form of a task list that's there, but I get it. I found podcasting and I love podcasting. I don't have to have checklists for it. No one is telling me, well, Jill, it's time for you to record the podcast. You better get upstairs and start doing it. I like doing it. I don't need a schedule. I don't need a checklist. I just do it. That's because I think I found the thing that I actually love doing. And so when we give up on those controlling situations, it means that we start feeling in control of our lives feel like we know what is supposed to happen. And then we start gaining confidence because we're on the right track. We're doing the thing that we really want to do, really good at doing, and it's really in line with what our purpose is. And he says how we get there is abandoning hope. We abandon the hope that we'll be perfect. We abandon the hope that we'll look great in the eyes of all the people around us. We abandon the hope that we'll actually get everything done that's on our to-do list. We abandon the hope that if we were just a little bit more productive, had a better checklist, had a better app, we would actually be able to get all those things done. Once we lose that hope, that's when we actually get what he says is liberation. He says, quote, once you no longer need to convince yourself that the world isn't filled with uncertainty and tragedy, you're free to focus on doing what you can to help. Once you no longer need to convince yourself that you'll do everything that needs doing, you're free to focus on doing a few things that count. And that's such an important point because it's not what we do. It's not how many things we do. It's not how great we are at productivity, according to him. It's actually sitting there and doing the things that really matter. Even in the worst of times, when you're doing the thing that gives you joy, it can't possibly stop you from it. And once we're actually away from all those things that he says is causing us problems, we'll be able to, quote, roll up our sleeves and start to work on what's gloriously possible instead. This, again, is a very dense book, and this is a lot to think about. And so I'm trying to pare some of this down. So you can get a look at what he's suggesting and see if this book is possibly for you. So my challenge to you is, can you come up with a list of the very things? Not that you feel like you should be doing, not that you feel that you must be doing, but on the one thing 
that is your purpose, is the thing that's going to move the world. This reminds me a little bit about the Ikigai podcast I did. But what's that one thing that if you'd be doing it, you would change the world and you would do so in a way that makes you extremely liberated and happy? All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a great week. Please remember to leave a review and tell a friend about this podcast because they'll be able to find out how they can use incremental steps to get the things that they want in life.